Hey guys, I just rolled over to 2 p.m. I um, just want to introduce myself and my colleague. So my name is Brandon Duclo. I'm the director of the network practice for Champion Solutions Group. I'm also here with my colleague Jason Milgram, who is our director of the Azure business practice. Today we're going to go ahead and get started with some Azure networking and security and just dive into a couple of the topics a little bit deeper. It's going to be led primarily by Jason. Also, guys, we're going to review the agenda here in a second, but also we're going to record this. We're going to send it out as well so that anybody has any questions, you miss something halfway through, we'll make sure you get a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording to your email. And then also, if you have any questions or anything going forward, feel free to enter it into the chat or into the questions box. We're going to try to answer things as we go, but we're also going to try and answer at the end too, so we don't want any questions to go unanswered. So just kind of going through our agenda this afternoon, we're going to go over the Azure Virtual LAN first. That'll be led by Jason and myself, and then we're going to jump into a little bit more on the security side, going to the Azure Firewall, and then into the different Azure Monitor, Event Hub, and then the Security Center and some of the SIM products that are running out today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jason, and let him kind of dive in here a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, I guess quick introductions. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jason Milgram. I'm the Azure Practice Director here at Champion. And then, uh, so that means I've been working in Azure for a long time. We have a great team here. We've helped uh, many clients move into Azure, and we've helped clients who were already in Azure just kind of improve uh, their, their network and security and also help them with you know, many different things, uh, including app modernization. But uh, Brandon, I'm not sure you introduced uh, uh, your role here at Champion. Yep, so my role at Champion is to run everything networking. So that includes going out to the cloud as well. So that could be anything agnostic from Cisco Brocade, different firewall vendors. We almost cover the gambit with it, and we can dive into that a little bit later here as well. But that's kind of what I'm doing on this side. So anything networking, regardless of where you're going, we'll be your guys to get you there. All right, and uh, Brandon's underselling himself. He is a, a network and security uh, subject matter expert and has a, a ton of different uh, certifications behind his name. So I'm very fortunate to have him on the call with us as well. So before we jump into the agenda, because um, we, we do have a very kind of wide audience here, uh, we just want to talk briefly about Azure and uh, about security and networking before we get into those specific topics. So for those of you who have uh, attended sessions with me in the past or I've done assessments or training or implementation work with you guys, uh, you've, you've all heard me say this before, uh, which is, um, you, know, you know, what is Azure? Uh, and sometimes that's kind of a hard question for people to answer because it's, it's, it's a lot of different things. So this is my personal definition. I've been using it. I, I think since uh, since Azure went GA and or became generally available in 2010, but uh, you know Azure is uh, Microsoft's global data centers, and as you can see from this slide, they are now in 54 regions around the globe. and And what they're doing is they're abstracting every piece of the enterprise puzzle into a service. Uh, so Azure is anything from you know DevOps to infrastructure. Uh, to app modernization, to big data, and, and to AI and machine learning. And that list uh, keeps on growing. Uh, there's over 100 different services in Azure now. Um, now, from a networking and security standpoint, I mean, you know, uh, Microsoft Azure is a, absolutely a first-class uh, uh, partner. Uh, in the networking and security side, and there's tremendous amount of infrastructure and security good, and goodness you get by moving workloads uh, into Azure. Most clients we work with are hybrid, meaning they're on-prem or in traditional racks, as well as in Azure. We have a number of, you know, that's majority of clients. We have quite a few, though, who are kind of what we call born in the cloud. They're, they've moved everything into the cloud. They try to have his little to no infrastructure at their various locations as possible. Um, so I could uh, I could definitely go on and talk more about kind of the general aspects of Azure security networking, but I know you guys all came here to, uh, to focus in on uh, uh, those four uh, initial topics. So let's, um, you know what, let's kick everything off with a poll question first. Uh, so give me a second. I'm going to 
load up the first poll question. And I believe I have launched the poll. And we'll keep it open, I guess, like for 30 seconds. Uh, so right now we're averaging about 50% of the folks on who have workloads running in Azure right now. Um, look like averaging 30% are saying yes, but only a small environment. Uh, and then uh, looks like 15 to 18% are saying planning uh, to start. And then 6% uh, have no plans to start in the near future. So we'll keep that open for just a little bit. All right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, close the poll there. All right, so thank you for taking the time to answer that poll. So the Azure WAN, uh, it was in preview. It's now generally available. It's uh, A lot of folks are very excited about this. So the Azure Virtual Wide Area Network, uh, it's a new service in Azure. It's designed to make it uh, easier to uh, connect your branch locations uh, to each other and also connect them up to your resources that you're placing in Azure. Uh, kind of at the highlighted level, it's to sets up an automated large-scale uh, connectivity uh, offering. It also, because of the way it's set up with the hubs, it allows you to have a unified network as well as policy management. We'll talk a little bit more what that means. And it also gives you, you know, optimized routing using the Microsoft Global Network. So, you know, all your branch locations, you know, their traffic, not only into Azure, but be, uh, among each other is running through uh, the Azure network. So you're going to experience, you know, a great uh, low latency um, and great performance there. So... You know, a lot of us right now in Azure, if, if you already have an environment in Azure, using site-to-site -site connections, point-to-site -site connections, or using Express Route, which is how we connect in PLS into Azure, uh, probably wondering, so how is, how is Azure WAN different? So that's what we hope to uh, explain with this slide. And then we'll actually jump in, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, Jason, let me chime in here real quick, too. Sure. So another nice benefit to that is, is you mentioned the site-to-site -site piece of it. What some of our customers may look at, too, is this may be a way to save some of your money on that expensive MPLS site. Pay Microsoft to do it. You're looking at data centers with sub-millisecond latency from point to point. I think that's a huge sell point on this piece. I know you're going to get into that here a little bit later. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, Right, so on one of the big differences... Uh, is between a traditional VPN gateway where you might have done site-to-site -site locations is that you were limited to 30 site-to-site -site connections. With the Azure WAN, you can have up to 1,000 site-to-site connections. So huge difference there. Also, the max bandwidth. Now, these numbers, you know, are changing, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, Microsoft marches through the roadmap and adds more features and functions. But... Um, you know, right now, the Azure WAN, which starts at 500 uh, megabits per second per what they call a scale unit, uh, you can scale that up to 200 gigabits. And to translate that, because uh, a bit, you know, if you want a byte, then you divide it by eight. So that's 2.5 gigabytes a second for bandwidth that you can get uh, at its top performance currently, as opposed to with the VPN site-to-site -site gateways, it's 1.2 gigabits, uh, which translates to 156 megabytes a second. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's very compelling, especially for people who have many branch offices and they've been wondering, you know, they've had to come up with different designs before with uh, multiple VNets and multiple uh, VPN gateways. You know, this is a much simpler solution to start building out your wide area network. Hey, Jason, I was paying attention. We had a couple of questions there from the initial slide you brought up on the WAN side of it. The first question was from 
a gentleman asking if the uh, does virtual WAN support Ike V1 as well as V2? And the answer is yes. Um, and that's a, that's actually a great question. Thanks for asking that, because it it kind of ties into this next slide, uh, which I'm not Brandon. I'll turn this over to you because you're our VPN device subject matter expert. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, you know how that relates to a, a follow-on question for this slide. Perfect. And then I saw another question out there as well, too. Um, I'm going to try and answer it here as we're going. So the answer is it can replace the MPLS piece of it and the VPN piece of it to some areas. So that's something that it is capable of doing today. It's not going to replace it 100% of the time, but you are going to notice some cost savings from what we've seen with clients as we run it up that way. And then also thank you, Jason, for kind of turning it over here for the SD-WAN piece of it. So today, these are the preferred VPN device partners they have out there. So they're preferring to work with Barracuda, they're preferring to work with Checkpoint, Citrix, and a couple other people that are out there. The reason they're really leaning into that technology is those are some of the early developers that were in the SD-WAN space. So you'll notice Riverbed. Riverbed's been out there for a while. Palo Alto Networks is out there because of some high-end backlog stuff they're doing with Riverbed, where they're taking that next-gen firewall and they're embedding it within the SD-WAN technology. And then I saw that there was a question out there, too, for, you mentioned no Cisco or Meraki. It's not preferred today, but yes, they can work. Right, and I'll, I'll add on to that, because that ties into that earlier question about the IPsec. Uh, and um, Any device supporting uh, the kind of Ike 1 or Ike 2 can work. Um, these are the preferred ones because they've built in a lot of automation. The idea is they, they want to make this as easy as possible to bring in a device, you know, plug it in, it will, you know, connect, pull down its configuration. Uh, they're trying to automate as much as possible. So any device uh, that supports, um, you know, uh, Ike 1 and 2, uh, will work, but these are the preferred ones, and of course that preferred list will kind of grow as, as more of the uh, vendors start supporting kind of these automated uh, or automatic um, uh, WAN deployment setups. All right, well, so thank we... Thank you for that, Jason. All right, so you might be wondering how to implement, uh, and my purpose of putting this here is it's not actually not that hard to implement. Um, now, you know, when building out your environment, you know, uh, you, initial focus, you want to focus on the network and security, and there's, you know, a number of considerations around that. But as far as building the WAN, uh, create your virtual network, you create the WAN, you create a site, you create the hub, you associate the sites with the hub, you connect your VNet to the hub, and then you download your VPN configurations, which uh, it's actually a single download after you build out your environment. But let me show you what that actually looks like. Uh, so on my screen, and then Brandon, let me know when you can see it. I'm showing my Azure portal. So perfect, I'm able to see it right now, and I can see all your different tabs and everything you have open as well too. Okay, so this is a uh, my personal test environment. I use this environment to do training and demos a lot. And I put together a virtual, well, I put the, together the initial pieces of a virtual WAN. So the first part you would do is you create the virtual WAN, which uh, one of these pieces, and I don't remember if it's the virtual WAN or the first hub, one of them takes 30 minutes in the background to create. So if you're in a pinch, don't think you can just quickly spin this up. Um, it's not hard to spin up, but one of the pieces takes about 30 minutes in the background to uh, finish completing. But you start out, oh, you know what? Let me click back on that overview page. So if this was a fully built out WAN, you know, I would see hubs, and I can have multiple hubs. In this case, I only have one. And then I can see the connectivity between my hubs and my sites. Um, but you start out by creating your hub. I'm sorry, you create the virtual WAN. Then you would create your VPN sites. Now, I created one. Uh, these essentially are the sites that, you know, you'd create a site for each location that you have. So if you have an office uh, in the East Coast uh, and one in the West Coast and one in the Central U.S., you'd create three sites uh, or as many sites as you need. And you can create up, uh, the v uh, virtual WAN supports up to 1,000. 
and you just click on create site. Then create your hubs. In this case, I created a single hub. After you create your hub or hubs, you go back to your sites and then you associate uh, the sites with one or more hubs. And so you click, you select the uh, sites that you need to associate and click new hub association. And then you pick the appropriate hub uh, from your options. Now in this case, I just have one. And after that, you go to your virtual networks and you connect those. Uh, so don't be intimidated. It's not hard to set up. Again, behind all this, uh, you know, you just you know, have to make sure you have a understanding of the network and the security involved. And actually, that leads me to um, a point I, I wanted to bring up earlier when we start talking about it. Uh, you know, uh, so for so those who are new to Azure, um, you know, if you come from a traditional data center background or networking and security background, I mean, the good news is everything you learned is true. Uh, it's still true. It's just in Azure because everything's abstracted as a service now. You know, the names of the puzzle pieces have changed and how you put them together has changed. And it's also one of the very powerful features of Azure because uh, it's absolutely evolved the nature of the data center where I have a clickable, a web-based clickable configure inter configurable interface that will allow me to build out you know, a next-gen data center with, you know, the, the networking and all the latest and security and compliance, uh, you know, right from this interface. And I can be anywhere and spin this up anywhere in the world. So uh, a great tool. It's definitely a, a huge change, and it's definitely an evolution of, of how we do uh, modern computing. So with that, I know we have a, a second uh, poll question. So we'll go ahead and launch that. And that is, uh, do you have remote locations? And we'll keep this open for about 30 seconds. All right, so we're averaging about 45% have between 1 and 10. We have uh, about 30 30% uh, who have a, between 11 and 100. We have about 13% who have over 100 locations. So the uh, Azure Virtual WAN is a, it's a, clearly there's a huge advantage for anyone who has to connect over 30 locations. However, even if you don't have 30, uh, the nature of how you connect them and the uh, bandwidth available to you uh, there's huge advantages there. So, you know, it's not just for people who have more than 30 locations. Uh, all right, I, I'll go ahead and close that poll. And uh, let's move on to the, uh, the next section, which is Azure Firewall. And hey, Jason, before we skip over here, there were a couple of questions I noticed that came out here. Um, one of them was asking, I'm not sure if we can find this out for the customer or not, but they were asking if the Azure WAN service offering is available in countries in the Africa region. Oh, great question. And the answer is yes, we can find that out. Um, uh, that's something we can rel quickly look up. But it brings up a good point. Um, Azure, the virtual WAN was recently, became generally available. And there are... Th uh, for right now, uh, you can connect sites to a hub um, in the same region, and that's in the current release. So, of course, with any service, there's a roadmap, and you can't go from zero to 100% uh, when you uh, when you release a product. So, just right now, um, you can connect sites only sites in the same region to a hub. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and as far as uh, support in different countries, that's something we could look up. So please, we'll, uh, if that's uh, something you type in a question, we'll be able to follow up with you on that uh, uh, post-webinar. Perfect. And then there was one more out there that I may be able to step in to answer. I saw they mentioned the SD-WAN VPN for Fortinet. 
I don't think it's preferred today on the Fortinet side. I may be wrong, but I know that you can still use the VPN connection into it, and you can still use some of the FD WAN functionality within the Fortinet side. Yeah. And again, you can use any of the VPN device that VPN devices that support the the standards. Um, it's just that with the the new preferred devices, it uh, it's more of an automated process, which makes it really nice. It's, it's not exactly plug and play, but you know it's getting pretty close to that, uh, which is great when especially you have to send out a device to a new location that is just being added. You know, you know, plug it in and uh, get the connectivity up and running. All right, so Azure Firewall, and uh, I notice I'm probably going to have to speed up on some of these because to cover all four topics, but Azure Firewall, um, this is new. Uh, we've had network security groups before. Uh, we have web application firewalls, WAFs, and next-gen firewalls all in Azure. So the Azure Firewall is a new offering. It is a highly available stateful firewall. What makes it very unique, well, un unique as compared to an NSG, which uh, I think all of us are, who've been working in Azure are very familiar with, uh, you can create a firewall and make it available across subscriptions and virtual networks. Um, it also has its own public IP address, so you can use it for uh, uh, what's called SNAT and uh, DNAT. Uh, so actually, uh, so uh, SNAT is source network address translation and the DNAT is destination network address translation, which means you can have devices who know the public IP of the firewall, but also devices that connect. So you can verify traffic is coming, outbound traffic is coming through your firewall. And those are all things that weren't, weren't available with the uh, network security group. Um, you know, I did, I did want to take time and, you know what, I think we have time. Brandon, I'm going to just jump and just show everyone the network security group, just to remind folks what that is. Okay, perfect. Let me know if there's anything you need me to jump in and chime in. I'm trying to keep up with all the questions that are coming on the side. Okay. So network security groups, those have been around. You can connect them. Uh, to a subnet and or your virtual network interface card associated with a virtual machine. And essentially it's, you have inbound rules and outbound rules. It's, it's very similar to the Windows fire, the Windows operating system firewall with Windows Server where you have inbound rules and outbound rules. And there's some cool things you can do with it, but it's, you, it's only connected to, you can either do it to a subnet and or to virtual network interfaces. Whereas the Azure Firewall, uh, you can uh, uh, connect it, it can, to the in, all network traffic can go through it, and you can associate it with not just one, but multiple subscriptions and multiple virtual networks. And, you know, there are some, uh, these are some of the high level kind of features around it. And uh, we'll also demo what it actually looks like when you spin it up in Azure. But Brandon, uh, any of these um, on the the networking side and security side that you would uh, that I think would be useful to elaborate on for the folks on the call? Definitely, would like to get into that here. I just want to answer one question because I think it was a good one here, real quick. Um, somebody was asking if the WAN, the firewall, supports IPv6. I didn't know if you knew the answer to that one off the top of your head, Jason. Hmm. I know IPv4 is good, but I'm not sure on the IPv6 side. Okay, so I want to say yes, absolutely, because I'm pretty sure it is, uh, but that would be something I'd have to double check. So let me, because uh, IPv6 is supported uh, with virtual networks, so I'd have to assume it is supported on the WAN side. But yeah, we'll, we'll definitely follow up uh, on that one, because we want to give you the 100% accurate information, not just, well, I'm, I'm you know, 90 9.5 percent sure perfect thank you Jason and then kind of jumping back over here to the Azure firewall features so the way that I see this is the traditional coming from a traditional network background is it's more of a it's not going to replace some of your next-gen firewall sets but what it is going to help with is the micro segmentation piece we're seeing grow out 
today within VMware and within some Cisco offerings. What Azure is doing here is they're bringing that to the cloud. So they're doing built-in high availability. They're building in their, the cloud scalability with it. They're also allowing you to go in. You can now do FQDN tagging with internal in the network. You can start to do some of those traffic filtering rules. And the nice thing that they're doing is they're doing it up to layer 7. So if you're looking at something like NSX or looking at Cisco ACI, those are doing it to layer 4 today. Azure on their cloud side, they're doing it to layer 7 on that micro-segmentation piece, which is something I think is really cool. All right. And let's, um, let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. So I'm clicking on the Azure Firewall resource in the Azure portal. And if you were creating a new one, you simply click on add and uh, there's never, you know, it's not simply clicking on it. But again, this is all a web-based configurable interface. So you create the resource. There's information you need to add to it. Uh, and for those of you who haven't been in the Azure portal recently, a number of the services now, they have this horizontal kind of breadcrumb trail that shows you the steps that you go through when creating uh, various services. So we fill out the basic information, then the tags, review everything, and create it. So I have one that I already spun up already, so we don't have to wait for this. And again, it starts with the overview, and uh, we'll just go right to rules. Uh, because, you know, this, it's a great service. It provides you with great functionality. It's not to be meant to be intimidating. Uh, so here it is, what it looks like. And when you're ready to add rules, your uh, NAT rule collections, your network rule collections, application rule connections, go to the section and then click on add and you start filling it out. So again, you have to know how you're configuring this uh, and that's where your traditional uh, networking and security knowledge come into play, especially if you're gonna have this firewall sit uh, you know, in front of or in conjunction with, uh, you know, not just maybe one subscription or one virtual network, but multiple ones. So there's planning required before you just uh, spin one up and put it into production. All right, uh, Brandon, anything else, anything that you want to add to this before we kind of go over what the pricing is for Azure Firewall? I think you've kind of knocked out everything on that piece of it. I saw some questions kind of come in. I know a bunch of you guys have sent some private pieces over to me too. This is mainly today for stuff that's on the back end. It's, I know some of you guys do some decryption and traffic and everything on premise. In this case, most of the traffic on the back end is decrypted already unless you're forcing the encryption. So that's just something I wanted to kind of answer out there as some of those questions would come in. And then I know they've asked again for the slides to be shared out. If you missed it at the beginning, we are going to share out these slides to you guys at the end. I know we're on a tight timeline. We're trying to keep things moving and get you guys' questions answered here as well too. Yeah, and then the the webinar is being recorded, so a link will be sent to uh, to everyone. All right, so uh, pricing. Yeah, I know I need to speed up because we we have a bit more to get through. But um, like it's a Azure utility service. You pay by the hour. So the Azure firewall that translates the dollar twenty five an hour translates to nine hundred twelve dollars and fifty cents a month. Fifty cents a month. It has an SLA of ninety nine point nine five. You do pay for inbound and outbound uh, data processing. So as an example, based on those rates, a terabyte in or out would be uh, $30. Another thing I just want to point out is uh, for those of you who use just-in-time uh, VM port management, which I highly advise from a, uh, uh, from a security aspect of, as far as reducing attack vectors, the uh, uh, JIT VM port management is not supported yet with this uh, firewall. Uh, so that's in the roadmap. I can't tell you exactly when. And then I think we have a, one more poll to launch. And this one is, do you have a security policy in place? And this is not a, an Azure, an, a formal Azure security policy, which is available in Azure resources. This is overall company-wide. Uh, do you guys have a kind of a formal uh, security policy, and we'll keep this open. Uh, looks like we're averaging 50 to 55 percent say yes and fully deployed, so excellent. Um, uh, about 22, 23 percent are uh, kind of yes in the middle of deployment, 
and then about 15 percent are uh, developing it okay great so we'll go ahead and close that poll thank you for uh, sharing that information all right all right this gets to our last topic which I've merged two of the topics into kind of this one because there's there's a bit to cover it's a very exciting area there's there's really lots to talk about in it um, and we're going to try to sum it up in like in I guess 20 minutes and also have time for questions uh, so Azure Monitor Event Hub Security Center and SIMS uh, so first uh, what is Azure Monitor uh, it's a Microsoft resource uh, for collecting and analyzing uh, data and that data is going to be used to help improve with performance and availability and a lot of other things so that's Azure Monitor it's uh, for collecting and analyzing data Event Hub is uh, it's kind of part of the big data solution it's a uh, it's an event ingestion service so it's capable of processing millions of events per second um, we have clients in the IOT space who event hub is absolutely critical uh, but it's a in again it's an ingestion service that can process you know millions of events per second so it's pretty awesome security center hopefully everyone's been uh, utilizing that uh, the, there there's the free version which has some great recommendations I highly advise going for the paid version uh, but um, it's you know it's a security management uh, kind of platform that you can use not just for Azure but uh, it's growing as far as kind of hybrid cloud environments and then sims um, a lot of us have heard of sims some of us think they might be related to the uh, sim games that used to exist but Brandon can you for those of us who don't know can you tell us what a sim is Yep, so this is for security incident and event monitor. So usually it's a client you're looking at going through, putting some kind of either behavior analytics or machine learning behind your logs just to start to look for anomalies on a day-to-day -day basis. That's really where that SIM tool comes in. And there's numerous ones out there with some of the top ones being IBM Q Radar. There's also Splunk that's out there. And there's a few other select partners too. And then some people just use traditional log servers and try to do their own machine learning on top of it. We've seen that come out there too. Okay. All right. So um, there's a, a number of things I wanted to show. I have a couple extra things. If we have time, I'll show. Let's focus on the, the SIM side first. So I am going to Azure Security Center. And then I'm scrolling down to Security Solutions. And... Here we have selected SIMs. Now, before I click on that, uh, for those of you who are, haven't been here in a while, you might notice non-Azure computers. So, yes, uh, you can actually start using Security Center to monitor your hybrid environment. So, VMs not in Azure. And some of you might also see uh, the common event format so for your Linux machines. And I, I love to talk about ATA and Azure ATP, but let's just click on SIM because uh, our time is limited. So my Azure, they've uh, created some pre-integrated uh, SIM connectors. And the pre-created connectors right now are IBM Q Radar, Splunk, Sumo Logic, ArcSight, and then uh, any syslog server and you have to have Azure Security Center set up you set up well you use Azure monitoring which we're going to take a look at all of that data goes into a vent hub and then from a vent hub through your connector that you set up it goes into your sim solution so for those of you who have been struggling with getting your uh, Azure uh, data and log information into your sim they're those pre-created uh, connectors. And again, if you're just using uh, a, a SIM solution that's um, it's not one of the ones with an existing connector, if you can take data in syslog format, uh, you can set that up through an Azure function. Uh, 
and have that sent uh, in syslog format to your sim solution. All right, so let me, um, there's still a couple more things you have to do to get this set up. And first is, uh, let's look at Azure Active Directory. So how to start getting that data into uh, the solution. So clicking on Azure Active Directory in the Azure portal and scrolling down, there's a couple ways you can do this. First, I'm just gonna click on Diagnostic Settings. So under Monitoring, and I've already added these, but I'm gonna show you how you would add it yourself. Just click on Add Diagnostic Setting. You have to give this a friendly name, and then you choose where's the data going. So I had previously created one, I send data to Log Analytics, and I also send it to Event Hub. So you're gonna wanna stream the data to uh, an event hub and here you choose an existing event hub that you have or create a new one and then you choose well what data is being sent so this is audit logs and sign-in logs so all those uh, user uh, users flag for risk or risky events that's the data that's going to be broken up in here you choose how much data or which types of data is going to go into your event hub and after you fill it out give it a friendly name you save it and now that's integrated. I'm streaming all that data uh, for my test account into Event Hub. Now, if you go through, that's one way to do it. If you look in the documentation, I think they tell you to click on audit logs. And essentially this is gonna do the same thing. Uh, you click on export data settings and it's gonna take you to the same section. So, you know, uh, there's always a couple different ways to go about doing the same things. Uh, so again, uh, uh, users flag for risk, risky sign-ins, sign-in audit logs, you can have all that go into Event Hub. Now let's look at Azure Monitor. Oh, actually, let's go ahead and look at Event Hub real quick. So this is the Event Hub that I have, and I have all the data going in there. Uh, Again, this is a small test environment, but you know, on the overview page, I can look through, you know, period of time on how much data has gone in, uh, last seven days or last 12 hours, and uh, I can do uh, some more setup from that. But that's the event hub, Azure Monitor. Um, this is. Uh, an Azure resource that is becoming kind of like a new uh, dashboard for monitoring many, uh, a lot of different information of about Azure. So we have application insights in here uh, under network that essentially opens up into Azure Network Watcher. So this is kind of a centralized place you go for monitoring. Something else I wanna point out is uh, you know, for those of us who had been using OMS in the past, uh, Operations Management Suite through Azure Log Analytics, if you go to your uh, OMS portal now, it has a, a, a very specific date uh, in January of 2019 where it will be turned off. And a lot of that functionality has been uh, moved e either right into Azure Active Directory or into Security Center or into Azure Monitor. So under insights, if you click on more, you're going to see a lot of, well, you're just going to see a number of those kind of OMS tiles that you used to see in the OMS portal. They're here now. And if you're looking for some of those other modules to turn on to, uh, to start analyzing the data that you're feeding in um, uh, into your uh, system, if you just click on add, you can start scrolling through and, you know, do your AD and Azure AD analytics, uh, SQL, uh, a lot of different uh, solutions that will create reports around the data that you're sending into this. So we already looked at how to turn on, uh, send your AD, Azure AD logging into uh, Event Hub, or into Azure Monitor, into Event Hub. You might be wondering, well, how do I turn on other uh, feed uh, more data into the solution. So under Azure Monitor, if you click on Diagnostic Settings, it's gonna show you uh, resources and it's gonna tell you if you've enabled those 
if you're sending that diagnostic data yet uh, into the system. So here I have a couple things turned on and a lot disabled. So let's say I want to uh, go to one of the um, a, a, a network security group that I have tied to a, a front-end Linux box. Uh, actually, I've enabled that. Let's find a different one. Um, yeah, let's just do even the public IP for that front-end Linux box. It's not enabled, so I select that particular resource. I click on Turn on Diagnostic Settings. Just like before, I give it a friendly name. And I say, well, is this going to a storage account, to Event Hub, or Log Analytics? I'm going to select Event Hub and select uh, the Event Hub I'm going to have the data sent to. And then I'm choosing, hey, what logging data and what metric uh, metrics data am I sending? And that's how you start turning out more and more things to feed more data in. The more data that uh, Azure Monitor is able to collect, it can do more analysis for you. And I think, um, Brandon, I know we probably have a couple more questions. There's a couple more things I want to show, but you tell me how many how many qu questions are we behind? Yeah. So right now, most of the questions were about the pricing. I think we can wrap those up towards the end of it because um, they were going back into some of like the virtual land, the firewall pieces of it. Okay. So I don't want to keep jumping between those topics. I think where you're at right now is good, and then we can get into some of those guys and the questions you have on the pricing piece of it. We're going to try and save for the end. We'll try and wrap up around 245, 250, giving us 10 to 15 minutes to start to knock out some of the questions. Okay. And uh, for those who are on, keep in mind, if we don't get to your question, they're all logged, so we'll uh, we'll start going through those, you know, post webinar and 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 do follow ups. Uh, so one thing I, uh, if you go to the old, I'll call it the old alerts resource in Azure. Notice it says alerts classic, and it has this little notice, hey, this is being retired, and that's because it's been all moved into Azure Monitor. So in Azure Monitor, if you uh, go to alerts. This is where you go to create your new alert rules, and it's pretty cool. Um, I was working with a, a client just last week, we were setting up a couple alerts, alerts in a training environment. You first select your targets for these, and you can do it by, uh, well, by multiple criteria. So you can do it uh, by subscription, by resource type, by resource group, uh, by specific resources. So I can do it by all resource types, or I can get uh, specific to, uh, let's say, uh, you know, virtual machines are, is very popular. And then I can say, hey, you know, I can go to a particular resource group, or I can do all resource groups, and I can go to an actual specific resource. I'm just going to say, you know, keep it very high level. Uh, and then I can start adding criteria. Now, what's great about the criteria now is uh, you can s it has pre-created alerts for me, so I don't actually have to create uh, the script on you know for you know to determine if a VM was created or updated. It has all these for me. Uh, and I can choose, is this log coming from, you know, categorized as administrative security recommendation policy or auto scale? So right now, with a couple clicks, I can create an alert and let, uh, to do a notification anytime a VM is created or updated in subscription, in a resource group. Uh, I can drill, create multiple criteria. And then, this is pretty cool. Uh, all right, let's go right to the action group because I know we're running out of time. You can create action groups. And in the action group, you can create multiple types of actions. And we're just having kind of a, I guess because I'm presenting. And this is being recorded. So under action types, you can automatically send out emails, make phone calls, send text messages. You can call, do webhooks. You can call uh, Azure Logic Apps. Uh, 
In fact, last week I just showed a client how easy it is based on any type of alert that you could get in the, uh, in the Azure portal, have that alert once it, it's, uh, it's registered sent right into Microsoft Teams or, or, or Slack. It's, it's just very, very, very easy to do. So I encourage you to start playing around if you haven't with the alerts in Azure Monitor because uh, it is uh, it's easy to use and it it can be extremely powerful. So with that, I think we uh, got to get to um, talk about our Azure Network and Security Assessment. So we're offering Azure Network and Security Assessments. This is just kind of a high level overview of some of the things that can uh, it can cover. And the last poll, the final poll that we'll launch will be so you can identify if you're interested and have a, uh, a Microsoft funded Azure networking assessment uh, done. Now, separate from that poll, if anyone was interested in Azure services, uh, you can go to messageops.com forward slash Azure hyphen services and you can fill out a request form. Uh, as Brandon mentioned earlier, a copy of the slides will be sent out and Everyone who attended uh, is automatically entered into a raffle for a, uh, a GoPro Hero 7. Uh, so that's everyone who attended the webinar. And let's go ahead and launch that last uh, poll. So this is, would you like to take advantage of the Microsoft funded network and, network and security assessment? We'll leave that open for a little bit. And we're averaging about 18% with a yes, uh, about 50% maybe, um, and then 33% uh, no. You know the numbers are going up and down. Uh, but these are great. We've uh, we've done Azure Network and Security assessments for many many clients. It's Microsoft funded, so it's essentially uh, you get free services, and a lot of the times. You know, it'll consist of we'll do training, we'll do a small workshop or proof of concept with you, and then we will uh, we'll actually create an assessment of moving resources into Azure. Uh, we can also offer assessments of existing Azure environments and, uh, you know, get into much more details on security networking and how you th have things set up. All right, so we'll go ahead and close that poll. Thank you for everyone who, uh, who took the time to, uh, to fill that out. Hey, Jason, one more thing on the Azure Network Assessments and Security piece. If we can, we can try and do some of that stuff here on my side with my team. We're looking at doing that, too, from the on-prem getting to Azure as well. So if you already have equipment on site, you're looking to figure out what we have. If it's capable, we can start to get to that piece as well. And then I saw right. somebody also ask a question. They sent it privately to me. Like, what size organizations kind of merit the assessment? Honestly, it, it's anything from... SMB up to larger customers were comfortable going across either side. Yeah, we've had uh, I think many SMB clients take advantage of the, the Microsoft funded assessments and uh, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of them have gotten great value out of it because we'll uh, we'll do training as well as a proof of concept or a small workshop and as well as the assessment. So it's it's a great way to uh, if you're moving into Azure or uh, your resources need some additional training or, you know, just, you know, assistance kind of working through a initial proof of concept. All right, so should we... Uh, Thank you there, Jason. Yeah, should we try to tackle some more of those questions? Yep, let's try and go through them here. So I tried to keep up with a bunch of them going through here. I know a lot of you guys were asking a lot of the questions. They came back to pricing on the Azure Firewall. Um, I know some of you asked if they kept it running for essentially 24 hours a day, 365. It came up to be almost 11K a year. I think that's close based on the numbers that we saw out there. Um, of course, you can do scripting to turn it up and turn it down or manually turning it up or down depending on when you have business and when you don't. I know that some work, works for some organizations. It may not work for all of them. So that's definitely something that's out there. And I know 
there was another question that you may be able to answer on this side, Jason. That was a question asked of the data transfer. Does that include transferring data to and from Office 365 internally as well? Uh, no, that is a good question. Um, to make sure we're giving you the 100% correct answer, I'd, I'd have to, we'd have to look that up. Awesome. So we can definitely pull that information for you guys. And I know another question was actually on the Azure Monitor and, and sending alerts. They were asking, can it interface directly with MS Service Center? Center, Microsoft Service Center is, I don't know, Brandon, maybe you can help me out. We Is is that tied to uh, Microsoft, uh, the, like SECM or SCOM? Microsoft Service Center. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with Microsoft Service Center. All right, we'll keep going through the questions. Some gentleman who asked that question, if you want to, if you could rephrase a little bit for us, we can definitely jump in to try and get you an answer on that. Um, there's another good question that came up asking if there's anything that can manage all the NSGs in one location. Um, so managing the NSGs, uh, well, the kind of the default answer is that all your NSGs will show up in uh, your NSG Azure resources. Um, so if you're looking to, uh, is the question that you're looking to manage the port settings from a centralized, from some centralized, and you can have those port settings pushed out to all the, to the, all the NSGs or select NSGs? Because if that's the question, uh, you can do that through uh, through scripting, um, but uh, it might be useful. We could have uh, maybe an offline conversation of what you know of what the goal is. Maybe there's some different ways of going about it that uh, might be simpler. Uh, Perfect. Then we can definitely dig into that one offline just to kind of keep some of the questions going, guys. I know we only have eight minutes left here on this side. Um, there's another gentleman that asked for best practices for cloud sim and avoiding the very expensive costs. I could talk a little bit on that one. I know if you're looking at Splunk and some of them, they're charging by terabyte or terabit coming into it per day, per hour. They have different models that are out there. There's some tools we work around that can help out with that piece of it. We'll definitely try and follow up on that side. They help out with dedupe and some stuff, both in the cloud and on-premise. And then there was another person that asked if the presentation will be available. Yes, this thing was being recorded. We're going to send out a PDF of slides and everything else on that piece of it. So you guys will start to see those as they come in. I think that, that's it for the questions. If anybody missed anything or if there's anybody that has a hand raised, I'm going to try and get to you guys here. I'm just starting to dig through it here now. Okay, and then and we'll also follow up with, uh, with folks for any if we go through and we find out we some missed missed some, so if we missed your question or or hand raise, uh, you know we apologize. We will we will uh, uh, do our best to go back through the uh, the webinar log and 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 connect with you. And everybody, thank you very much for joining us today from the champion side of things. Uh, we have myself, Brandon Duclo, and Jason on today. So any questions that come up. Feel free to, to kick them over. Um, we're going to go ahead and send out these presentations and everything to everybody. Jason, do you have anything else you'd like to add here before we wrap it all up? No, other than, you know, thanks for attending. And, you know, Azure is a very, uh, it's a very wide and deep offering. And, you know, if you have questions, if you need training, if you need implementation, uh, you know, we're here to, to assist you with that. Um, and, uh, you know, we can cover number of different use cases, what we've done with uh, clients of, in different industries across different, uh, you know, client sizes. So, you know, I think we can bring a lot of value to uh, helping you either kind of achieve the goals that you have or, you know, overcoming particular challenges with a particular uh, deployment or implementation that you're trying to do. So we, we'd love to, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to partner with you uh, during, as part of your Azure journey. 
Great. Thank you very much there. Let me just make sure there's no more questions here before we wrap everything up. Awesome. Looks like just people saying, saying thank you to both for everybody. So we're definitely here. We definitely want to help you guys and, and see whatever we can do here. If you have any ideas about future webinars, stuff you guys would like to hear, feel free to throw that in the questions or anything else, guys. Uh, if not, we'll try and give you uh, five minutes back in your day, and I hope you guys all have a great week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.